Welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to uh, give you a warm welcome this morning from wherever you are. I would bet most of you are from working from home. Uh, but uh, this is the first panel of our second edition of the Connected Virtual Tech event. And welcome to our event. Uh, I want to thank everyone who worked so hard to put this event together, especially uh, Aaron Friedman from my team, Peter, uh, and a number of other people who have helped out. But uh, without their hard work and um, long late night hours, we wouldn't be here. Um, and so um, I also wanted to uh, thank all of our sponsors who've made it possible for this event uh, to be free to all of you to learn, to network, and to communicate. Uh, also, special thanks to our uh, key sponsors, ONGO, the CBRS Alliance, who is our lead sponsor, Crown Castle, who is our registration sponsor, and Annexter, who is our pavilion sponsor. Uh, the sponsor of this panel today is JMA. And uh, just a few reminders to please visit our exhibitors on the exhibit floor, including JMA um, and the other terrific companies like CTS, Extinet, VIEW, Geoverse, and many, many more that you'll be able to see. Also, please take the opportunity to visit our chat rooms. Uh, you can get them through the booths or through the lounge area. There's also a, um, in the lobby area, is also a description of how to navigate the uh, show itself. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my esteemed panel today. Uh, with us, we have J.P. Flaherty from uh, a uh, lovely company called Tishman Spire. Um, Kent Tarek. Kent is a, an industry expert uh, and has been with uh, Brookfield for many years in the past. Um, Eric Abbott, he, who is an adjunct professor at Northwestern. Chris Rising from Rising Realty and Rahul Bami from VIEW. And so without uh, further ado, I wanna jump in and talk with our panel today. Um, we're gonna start with JP. Good morning, JP, thank you for being here. Um, talk us through what's going on from where you sit. Again, the panel's called View from the Top. Um, I consider the folks on this panel to have that view and, and be looking down on, on, I shouldn't say looking down, looking at what's going on in the commercial real estate space. Um, Talk us through how are things going with the return to work? Uh, what are you seeing out there? Um, and inform us, please. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. Well, I'll just spend a minute on return to work um, and then talk a little bit about more of the challenges we're seeing in the telecom and DAS and wireless space. But from a return to work perspective, uh, all of our buildings are open across the United States and, well, almost every single one and across the uh, majority of our markets around the uh, world. Um, you know, the reality is none of our buildings actually closed um, because one of the very interesting things we've found in the last uh, three months is that uh, the people who were going to work were actually uh, not in our per se Tishman Spire corporate office, but in our buildings, the actual essential workers were the IT workers. And what we saw was that huge numbers of uh, not huge numbers, large quantities of energy were used in our buildings by our tenants when nobody was in the building, which was a surprising development. Um, I mean, we had a sense uh, of how much IT equipment was in these offices, but I don't think we truly understood the magnitude of that. And what that really means is just, we would have assumed that our energy consumption on a base building basis went down anywhere from 20 to 40% as we, we still operated our buildings, but with far fewer people, you need less energy. Our tenants saw far less reductions. And what we come to realize is that that was because they have all the IT equipment on, they're all virtually VPNing into their desktop machines. And so the actual change in energy consumption by our tenants was quite small and that the IT loads uh, were, were, as it turns out, very large portion of the total energy consumption. Um, anyway, it's a long way of saying the people actually coming into our office over the last three months were principally people on the IT teams of all of our tenants, keeping all of these uh, servers, video conferences, desktops, VPNs, and everything else uh, uh, moving in their work environment. So uh, the essential workers turned out to be the IT workers, at least for uh, our buildings. And, um, and that's what we've seen really across the board. All of our buildings remained open for that purpose and, and for anybody, obviously, but you had to be an essential worker. Um, now they're all open to pretty much uh, anybody who'd like to come back based on the occupancy rules in that market. So for example, New York, it's 50% occupancy. 
um, but uh, by law. But but basically, that's uh, that's the current status. Um, and uh, what we haven't yet seen is, and, and again, we'll jump to the meat of the conversation in just a moment, but to just address something I think that's been discussed a lot in the press about things like elevator capacity and other matters that would drive to the occupancy issues within buildings. We just haven't seen that level of occupancy return yet to have any of those problems actually be an issue. So to the extent that uh, you know people are concerned about too many people in elevators or, or how the actual lobbies work, um, in none of our markets have we seen uh, enough people come back yet where that is a driver of problems at all. That may happen after Labor Day and we'll see, but at the moment that hasn't been a, uh, a principal issue. So turning uh, broadly to the sort of telecom and DAS space and, and what we're seeing is a continuation of things, Rich, that we talked about back in Florida, which seems like, oh man, ages and ages and ages ago um, that we were in Fort Lauderdale. Um, but actually it was this year, uh, as I remember that, but boy, does that seem like a long time ago. Um, but But the trend there was discussing how we look at um, providing these services within our buildings. And, you know, the, the thing that we talked about a bunch in Florida was the market where the owners don't have to pay is shrinking. And as the carriers and third party operators find it increasingly difficult to fund the capital of these projects, it is increasingly becoming the landlord's responsibility to both fund and figure out how to make these systems work. The other thing we're finding is that uh, it's becoming increasingly complex with very large tenants to, they kind of want to do their own thing, which has always been the case on a telecom basis, but now it is the case potentially on other types of services as well. And that works well in um, places where you don't have all these tenants st stacked on top of each other, but in tall office buildings, it's a bit more of a challenge. So in thinking how we can provide those services, uh, and again, we're talking about here, uh, DAS related to the carriers, as well as potentially building wide Wi-Fi and other telecom services, those, are systems that in the past we got other people to pay for and it was great and we were perfectly happy to do so that is very clearly not the model today we can get occasionally capital contributions from carriers but the game is much more today about the landlord figuring out how to solve for those problems and trying to figure out how to work with tenants to make sure that they get what they're interested in as well um, and what I mean by that is some tenants have don't have a carrier preference some must have AT&T some must have whatever carrier it might be. And so that is uh, also a added complexity because some carriers are much more interested than others in coming onto these systems and, uh, and making the capital contribution. Gotcha. The last piece I would add, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Rich, is the other big trend is obviously everybody talks about 5G. I, you know, that has not really been yet an issue for us as a landlord in the sense that, as you know, 5G is not really an indoor oper uh, system yet. It's really an outdoor play. We have seen carriers come to us in some of the uh, very dense urban areas that we operate in. They're all very interested in uh, roof space and specifically roof space at certain heights. And so that has certainly been a uh, driver of the conversation. But to the extent that 5G is something we're talking about, it's something we're talking about planning for the future, which means making sure that you overbuild in your buildings with more fiber, more conduits, more whatever, and we can put the antennas on when that uh, ends up being available and a mainstream move. But right now it's making sure that we overbuild systems to have the capacity in the future to uh, extend out into the 5G universe when that comes. I, you know, I think that the, the, and that appears to be, you know, still a year or two or three away. Obviously we don't see many customers coming to our buildings with 5G phones, despite AT&T's claiming that my crappy iPhone 9 has somehow magically gotten 5G E, whatever that is. That's not what is actually happening. And so we don't see a demand really for that right now without actual handsets that are, are using that. Very, very few of our people are coming in with that. And so that just hasn't gotten there yet. I, I see that coming for sure. Um, but the carriers aren't really focused on that right now, at least indoor 5G. And to the extent they're interested in having that conversation, they want to talk about rooftops and antenna locations, not necessarily yep. um, the existing DAS or future DAS systems that are installed. Yep. And then the last thing I would say is that I think, you know, when there's been a lot of discussion of is the sort of big clunky, and I think that was the term you used, Rich, big clunky old coaxial DAS, is that the answer? And, you know, there's a lot of talk of, of, of all sorts of other solutions that can provide those connectivity options. 
And, and obviously the downside of the current DAS systems is that they age fairly quickly. Um, but that being said, that seems to work pretty well. And, um, and so I think we're reluctant to move off of that model until there's a clear um, a model that, that works as well and um, has been deployed widely. Gotcha. So those are kind of the big trends we're seeing, uh, Rich, and I will turn it back over to you and, and we can get more into detail in just a moment. Thank you. I think you've really encapsulated, um, you know, sort of the situation as you see it really well. So Kent, um, uh, similar thoughts, uh, disagree, agree, you know, what's your thinking on this topic? Sure. So JP touched on a lot of the same things that, that I'm hearing in the market as well. And he's got a much deeper technical background, I think, than I do. Uh, but, but talking more about kind of the strategy of what, uh, what the large institutional owner operators were, were doing prior to the COVID uh, pandemic and, and now how the thinking has evolved, um, you know, already underway was the uh, implementation of a, a number of different technologies within our buildings to give us deeper insight into how uh, how our buildings are operating, uh, how they're performing, uh, how people are interacting with them. Uh, and, and so what that was launching was the need for a variety of different uh, data sensor, or sensor networks uh, to, to support these various digital twin solutions and other, um, other technologies, again, to give us this, uh, this level of, of data and insight into our buildings. And so what, this, what the, the COVID situation has now encouraged is an acceleration of that. P uh, landlords and operators, both large and small, are recognizing that we need more real-time understanding of how our buildings are operating, how people are interacting with them, so we can respond more proactively to them. Uh, exactly to, to JP's point, you know, the 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 energy usage of these buildings is staying high, regardless of people building it, uh, being in them or not, because of the uh, the the the, uh, the energy needed by the the IT systems that are embedded within them. Uh, so that's continued, uh, but um, you know these are these are things that uh, that again we need to have deeper understanding of uh, in a situation like this. And so, uh, you know, again, both pre-COVID and now post-COVID, uh, one of the recurring strategies that that we've been exploring and keeping track of is uh, the flexible office solution. Um, you know, certainly tenants, uh, both large and small, are, in court, are are looking to see how they can increase the flexibility. Of the uh, of their of their workspace, uh, and so now as tenants become more apprehensive about signing long-term leases, not sure about the uh, what the timing is for the return to work, um, and exactly how people will work, whether it'll be back in the main office in, in CBD hubs, whether it'll be some combination of a hub and spoke where people are out in the suburbs, uh, or or also working from home, uh, how those those kind of tie together. And I think what's going to, what this is going to further encourage is for landlords to need to continue to expand upon their, their flexible office solutions. But beyond that, also uh, providing increased services. Um, one thing that is interesting is, as JP touched on, is tenants were looking for uh, more customized solutions for their own office needs uh, and, and how uh, tenants or landlords could support that effort. Uh, but now, uh, if they are more distributed in, in their, uh, the, the workplace is more distributed in how people are, are working and where they're working from, uh, we believe that there might be a need for landlords to make it take a more proactive role in providing additional services in saying, okay, here's, we'll provide the, it, it's more plug and play ready, I should say, in, in how people are, are coming to the workspace. And by doing that, uh, we need to have closer relationships with our telecom providers and other connectivity providers to both provide services that allow us to connect within buildings, uh, multiple spaces within buildings, across, um, across uh, combined portfolios, uh, and then even looking out uh, so that we can provide connectivity uh, into, into suburban workspaces as well as the CBD. And so, what, how can technology support some of those efforts? Uh, and last but not least, um, the, the, uh, on, on the DAS side, uh, there is an increased need, demand, I should say, for, for landlords to have to pay for those services. Historically, we were able to, uh, to kind of get away with, with having a provider come in and pay for that uh, technology to be installed, but uh, that seems to be moving away. And so finding other solutions and technologies that allow us to, to reduce the cost while providing an increased level of service around that is, is critical. Um, you know, th then pivoting a little bit and talking a little bit about the return to work, um, just to provide some guidance. 
uh, the feedback that we're getting from, uh, or I'm getting from the large institutional operators is that uh, they're thinking by year end, we might get to 40 to 50% uh, back in the office uh, of the normal um, work pace population. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the as, as companies are underwriting uh, the return to work scenarios and landlords are underwriting uh, kind of the impact that the building value, that, that's kind of the metric that, that's been used. Uh, and so that, w with that understanding, um, you know, up until about 60%, maybe a little bit more than that, uh, there, we, we see very little challenges with elevators and, and uh, other issues with that. It's really once it goes beyond that, that we'll have to start thinking about, uh, you know, how, how to get people into the building because there could be some, some backups and things that we need to start paying attention to in our elevator lobby. But uh, that remains to be seen. And, uh, and you know, it's a, it's a constantly evolving uh, situation that we're up against. But you know, the incorporation of technology to allow us to, uh, again, more proactively understand how people are interacting with our buildings uh, will allow us to, to manage that more effectively. Gotcha. That's, uh, that's well put. Thank you, Ken. Um, so, Eric, you're more um, concerned in working with the uh, hospitals and healthcare aspect of this, and that's a really interesting uh, and important uh, thought process and, and uh, area of interest to I think the most of the people listening in here. Um, talk us through what's going on in the hospitals and healthcare space in, in the, with this topic. And, and again, especially in light of COVID and hospital stays, uh, how are you seeing the, things roll out? Yeah, no, uh, excellent uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, Rich, and, and good morning, everyone. I think it's um, one of the things that COVID is, is really forced upon the healthcare industry in particular um, is organic rethinking of how care is delivered, uh, but also uh, to what extent uh, care uh, belongs in different domain areas. Um, so it's, it's looking at the broader scope of health and wellness combined. And I think the connectivity is something that's really uh, percolated to the top of mind for, for many in the industry, specifically CTOs, CIOs of leading healthcare organizations. Um, Generally speaking, there's three areas. One is driving better uh, clinical effectiveness. The second is operational efficiencies. And most importantly now is what's called the consumer experience. How do we make healthcare uh, and access to those services understandable, affordable, uh, and equanimous? And I think one of the things that's really interesting um, that COVID provoked um, is the challenges uh, of executing on those three domains as it relates to connectivity. So uh, there's been a lot of um, examination um, as to you know, what are those next steps? So specifically, what does the hospital of the future look like? What does the clinic of the future look like? And very intriguingly, what does the home of the future look like as it relates to providing um, high performing connectivity capabilities um, so many of, of you and, and those in the audience are, are probably, if not already, um, may have experienced what's called a telehealth session. Um, sometimes it comes under the moniker of virtual health. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because pragmatically, a lot of people consider it from the consumer standpoint, but what about from the physician and the nursing team and so forth uh, that are in an office setting? How are they able to have robust connectivity in something that is able to bring together a patient with that care team where they're able to collect meaningful information. So remote patient monitoring capabilities such as um, wireless connectivity of vitals uh, systems. So this could be everything from blood pressure, temperature, and so forth as part of that sort of encounter is something that the industry um, has really uh, you know, woken up to, to trying to resolve. So what that means is they need to have robust connectivity um, inside the traditional uh, avenues or, or places of healthcare. So you can reach out in the medical home situation. Similarly, you need to have that, that handshake, if you will, um, and that coordination to make it something that's uh, realistic. So we, we don't have jitter, we don't have delay, some of the other technical things uh, becomes very, very important. Um, I think, so that's one aspect. The second aspect I think that what we're seeing is something called um, uh, peri-health. Um, and holistic wellness. So it's not just about what I'll say these discrete ad hoc encounters in some ways, but it's how do you maintain connectivity with healthcare services as part of your journey. 
So um, the use of wearables is a really good example. Let's say it's a, a Fitbit or something similar to that. Being able to collect that data, having the healthcare industry as a whole being able to access that data requires connectivity um, that's very robust. So we, you know, clearly we can't have things that drop off. Um, so it's really looking at the entire landscape of someone's activities and so forth. And what are those services? Um, do we see a future where uh, care will be delivered in a workplace setting? Absolutely. Um, there's already some companies that made investment in systems. Um, think of it as the, the modern version of the, the corner store pharmacy uh, booth where you used to do your blood pressure. Um, it's very sophisticated now. You can do uh, diabetic retinal exams. You can do uh, temperature checks, blood pressure checks. Some companies are even working on, um, I kid you not, um, ways to do uh, blood draws um, and then be able to do assessments from there. Um, what this all rides on though is the, uh, the ability to have highly secure, very private uh, and ro robustly forming connectivity. Without that, it's just not possible. Got it. So thanks, Eric. And I appreciate that very much because I think a lot of people that are listening, um, you know, look at the healthcare space as, you know, a, a very different business than the um, commercial real estate space, but yet hospitals are just buildings after all. So Chris, um, I love having you on these things because oftentimes you've got a very distinct thought process about things that's quite different. And so uh, I want to bring you into this discussion and, and tell us what you're seeing. You're in California. You're out there with all the hippies. Um, so what's going on in your world uh, in this setting? Well, first of all, Rich, I'm sitting here stewing going, how did I lose the lottery to go so late in this with all these smart people on it? Um, so um, I would say that JP and Kent really um, outline what we're experiencing in our 5 million square feet. Um, I would say that uh, we have been surprised at the uh, utility load in our buildings, considering that they're somewhere between 15 and 20 percent occupied on a daily basis. Um, fortunately, in the long run, people are still paying their rent and we're healthy um, financially, and, that, and that's been good. Um, the use of VPNs has been really interesting. You know, we're seeing more and more companies, they, they most likely don't have a server in our buildings, but they have their VPN in some, uh, you know, uh, Meraki antenna or something. So people are coming back to the building and then shooting out. Um, we're certainly seeing some things that are scary in terms of security. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll talk about it. But on a, on a broader basis, what, what you and I had talked about is before, and I think it's important to put in perspective, I see four things going on right now. And I got to be honest, I think it's, I think it's pretty scary for the economy. I think it's pretty scary for office owners. But the first is, that we are in a pandemic that just doesn't seem to want to end. I was reading today about all the deaths that are that are happening every day and the numbers going on. So, you know, I, I see a lot of people making decisions, especially how they're using technology or what they're going to do work from home. And I just have this sense that everybody's still in a bunker and any long term decision anyone's making is really out of triage. It's not a long term decision. I saw on Twitter today a, a prominent CEO say it took us two years to try to figure out our dress code in two months to decide nobody had to come into the office. I mean, those are not long, long-term decisions for how you're gonna run a company and culture. And I think, so what we're seeing right now is people doing the best they can to adapt. And um, I had a, a meeting yesterday, uh, a Zoom meeting, and I, and I can tell you that the general feeling was um, doing these kind of events with Zoom make a lot of sense. Trying to have three or four Zoom meetings with your team a day does not work. People uh, are looking down at screens, they're looking down at their other things. So I think this triage we're in is exactly what it is. We're in a pandemic, we're in a bunker, the tornado's overhead. So I, I'm not one who thinks that just because Twitter is in a war to try to get talent says, you know, you never have, come, have to come back to the office, that that's necessarily long-term. We've heard it from IBM over the years, Yahoo. I think they're doing what they can to attract talent at a time where you can't be face-to-face -face with people. The second thing is, is we're in a recession and anybody who thinks we're not in a recession, I mean, come on, we are in a recession and what happens in recessions? I mean, I've lived through, this will be my fourth. What's the first thing the CFO does? How do I cut costs? What's one of their fixed costs? People in real estate, right? I mean, that's what it is. So anybody who can get out of a lease, um, I, I see why they, they, they may do it. What we're seeing from large law firms is everybody, if they have a lease coming up, they're everyone's kicking the can for two or three years. 
The third thing, and I think this is really important, we're on a generational shift right now. The average age of a CEO is 51 years old. Uh, of a CFO, they are 48 years old, if you look at public companies. That's Gen X, that's my generation. There's a lot of millennials. And when these, when these things happen, these generational changes happen, you know, that's 20 years of looking up at the boss saying, I think they're doing it wrong. And this is also a generation, you know, as my father said to me, I think he thought I majored at Duke University and Nintendo to my graduate work in, in PlayStation. So, so you know, I, I grew up totally different than the baby boomer running a company. And so, I, you know, I love technology. I think there's a whole generation of new leaders who love technology. And I think the fourth thing that's going on is about 10 years ago, Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world. It's eaten it. It's processed it. I mean, we are having big change because, it's, because of check technology. You put that all into this blender of a pandemic. I just think it's hard to, to, to point to long-term trends that are going to stick. I think people are going to try this work from home. For, uh, I, you know, one of my employees said, please stop calling it that. Call it live from work. I never get off, the, I never stop working. Um, but in the long run, what I think we're going to see is if you're a commercial, if you're an owner of commercial real estate and you want to lease your building, the, the expectation on services has gone up triple and flexible space is going to be huge. Um, I think your tech, I think, you know, for years it was, did we have the right you know, coffee shop? Did we have a gym? Do we have that? And I think more and more you're seeing the, uh, chief technology officers are going to be a part of this saying, do, you know, does your phone work in an elevator? That kind of matters to people now. What's my broadband speed when I'm sitting in the lobby or if I go out and work outside? Um, th these things that have been talked about are now, I think, going to be cemented as, um, as, as, as part of a due diligence when a tenant goes to look at space. So, I, um, you know, I, I'm just as depressed as I me. Mean, I like going to the office. I like being around people. I also have to say I like not having traffic and I like, I like if I can do three meetings from home and then get in at 10. So, you know, our company, and I'll just, I'll, I'll end it here. We're, we've made three uh, big changes or well, three big changes. Number one, <clears throat> we've gotten rid of business hours. Unless you're the property manager, you have to be there at eight 30 and none of our, none of our stuff has, has changed. I mean, uh, we haven't closed any buildings. Our parking people, uh, limited, but they still show up. Our security, our janitorial, they're all there. But from a corporate standpoint, we're, we're just saying, look, work it out with your supervisor. So that's a big change. Second thing is that we've gotten rid of PTO. Um, we just decided that we're going to hold people responsible. They want to take a month off. They can take a month off. You got to get your work done. Um, and then the third thing is we've, we've made a, a reinvestment in even more technology in terms of project management, and, and some of the software we use. Like we, we're, we're every software that had a higher up version that we said, well, maybe people aren't using. Uh, we've decided now to make the investment so that people truly can be working um, anywhere, but also be held accountable for their work anywhere. So those are, those are big changes until people feel like they can go back to work. And I think, you know, what New York has gone through is an is a unbelievably sad experience. And I think that shapes because that's where the money center is. A lot of when businesses are going to come back, uh, whether the business is in San Francisco or in, in Austin, I think there's a lot of fear about liability as an employer, if I force my people back or not. And so, I mean, I think it's a, I think we're going to have a real tough year or two uh, in the economy and the people who are going to come out the other end are the ones who understand how to use technology and implement it in the projects they're in. So hopefully oh, I didn't go Chris. too long. It's tough yeah, to so, keep up with this group. <laughs> gotcha. So I congratulate you. You're the first comment that we got on this. Somebody commented that a buddy of mine actually said, live from work. I love it. Um, so you got, uh, you're, you're up one on, uh, on the others, even though we have a great opportunity and a great team here. So. Um, Rich, a chance to respond to, to Chris there. Sure. Yeah. I just, just I want one. Get through Rahul. Yeah. Very, very quickly. I think um, something Chris mentioned, I think is really important. Um, one of the bright spots is going to be a hospital facility operations where to his point about technology, being able to bring inpatient telehealth to reduce PPE, the building automation capabilities is especially crucial. So being able to handle without having to touch different surfaces and so forth. Uh, being able to have display technology that you can have a conversation with um, or have a huddle around 
uh, including remote participants. All that's very important. And I think Rahul's technology um, actually is, is a, a huge opportunity potential um, in healthcare. So I just wanted to, to bring that forward. Good. So Rahul, let's go to you. Uh, since we've been talking so much about technology, um, I met a couple of your people, um, oh, almost a year ago, and just really became enamored with what you guys are doing. Um, so Peter, let's put up the uh, slides for, uh, for Rahul. Um, so uh, tell us about VIEW, what you guys have, have done in terms of the technology space, because I think this is really um, you know, life-changing um, uh, for, for companies and for landlords. So Rahul, why don't you take it from here and talk about the technology piece? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rich. And, you know, I'll maybe spend a, uh, a minute on uh, what we see as uh, some of the key trends. And I think they'll echo a lot of what everybody else has shared. Um, you know, broadly, uh, we see what I classify as three really broad mega trends we see in real estate. And, you know, we sell into commercial real estate. We work with corporate estate owners, healthcare, airports, fair amount of higher education. So, We've got exposure to a few verticals. Uh, you know, there's one obvious one that's been a lot around for a while, which is around primarily sustainability and energy efficiency. One of the changes we see, I'd say, over the last decade is there's more of a movement from how do I meet code or regulations to how do I actually become more effective and efficient at it. Uh, there's a second one around broadly taking the experience, the human experience in buildings further to comfort and health and productivity. Uh, this is one of those that, you know, I think as we've learned more about our physiology, we saw this happen earlier with food. You know, we got more conscious 20 years ago from consuming food for taste to consuming healthier food. We saw it with our physiology and uh, exercise. We now see more and more people caring about their, uh, what environment they live in and where they spend their time. Um, this was in process, I'd say with probably just the leading edge folks for the last four or five years. I'd say the pandemic has accelerated that quite a bit and I'll talk a little more about it. The third one is really around technology. And I think everybody here has talked about technology. I, I put it as intelligent buildings here, but that's really more broadly about technology. Uh, what we have seen is I think the pandemic is accelerating change. So trends that would have taken five to seven years are now in some cases out of necessity happening in 12 to 18 months. Uh, I, I agree with Chris that, you know, video conferencing and remote work is not the new way of life, but look at how quickly it's gotten adopted. So it's here to stay. It's not going away. People have talked about it for a decade, but uh, suddenly in two months, everybody figured out how to do this. Um, we've seen sensitivity and awareness to health and cleanliness go up a lot and just wellness in buildings. Suddenly uh, we have clients who used to use us uh, broadly saying, hey, I'm glad I don't have blinds in my buildings, for example. I'm doing extra cleanings and so on because they're all sources of germs and infections and so on. And so people, it's almost a hypersensitive environment from that perspective. Uh, I've repeatedly heard that densification is over. That's been going, you know, there's been a trend towards densifying environments for, uh, uh, for a decade or so. That is effectively, at least for now, over. Interestingly, you also see people spending a lot more time on future proofing their assets and really building in technology infrastructure, because I think all of us know that change is accelerating. It's happening. We may not know exactly what we need, but we do know that if we don't think about it now, we're going to be in trouble uh, going forward. So there's a much bigger focus on connectivity, on building in bandwidth for additional applications that happen, uh, and just a broader adoption of technology. So with that, if you can hit next in the slide, I just want to explain what we do. Uh, a lot of users may not be familiar. View is uh, first just a minute on the company. We're a 12 year old company based in Silicon Valley. Uh, most of us came from the tech world, either semiconductors or software or electronics. Uh, we essentially make what you can think broadly of a smart glass, which is just sunglasses for buildings is the easy way to think about it. Um, uh, this is actually a, an installation in uh, Avenue of the Americas, New York. So that's where you see that view. But basically, as you see, as the sun moves across, uh, glass is clear. You notice there are no blinds on it. You have your view. This is why we named the company view. And 
apart from the fact that it give you know it gives you back your view there's huge benefits around uh just exposure to natural light and what it does for your circadian rhythms uh and i'll spend a minute on it in a second could you hit next again um uh, and while this looks like a sorry it, if you go back one i think there was you may have hit it twice no never okay um never mind yeah so this is a fully designed system every window has an ip address uh there's electronics that uh you know we provide data and power to every single window you don't see that it's obviously integrated seamlessly into the building we we are vertically integrated we make the panels we write our software we design the electronics um uh the windows operate on algorithms just like a tesla the software gets up upgraded every couple of months so once we're in a building the building continues to get smarter over time um if you hit next and i'll talk about a couple of uh uh benefits here or examples one is the health benefits you know this is um we've all known or know that natural light is good for us that's not a big revelation i think what's what's a revelation is people have always struggled to quantify it and you know 10 years ago when people talked about it people would wave their hands and say yeah, yeah i know but that those are like soft benefits now there's a lot of academic independent kind of robust research that has proven those benefits out and you see some amazing results with people's eye strain and headaches going away or dropping by over 50% drowsiness going away people actually sleeping better as a result of that cognitive function increasing uh and these are i think the world is going to learn to actually account for these in their spreadsheets as we go forward right it's not going to be just about its energy and what your kilowatt hour saving it's really all of us spend about 90% of our time in those and buildings uh so uh, several several let's say the leading players are already adopting you know are taking this into the decision making process we'll see this broadly accelerate uh if you hit next um uh uh so how do we actually use for this panel more importantly for uh, uh you know how do we utilize this technology infrastructure and i'll spend really a quick minute on this you could yeah just i, I want to get back and want to do uh, another round robin for everybody so rahul let's uh, let's go through this quickly sure i'll go through it quickly but if you see this on the on the left you know i talked about infrastructure and buildings so we're essentially building in smart infrastructure and you see the this black um thing on the side is really what goes into window frames and essentially that's building in every possible sensor you could think of in terms of temperature acoustics uh moisture sensitivity air quality co2 and so on and we've been working on these for 3 to 5 years early on we saw hospital clients pick these up because their healthcare environments they're naturally attuned to caring about these now we've really got these applications and offices where that enables things like contactless check-ins indoor wayfinding distance monitoring actually being able to detect and this is another manifestation of technology being able to detect if you're sick if your surfaces are clean so several different uh, potential applications rich get hit next again we'll go through yeah well, yeah uh why don't we go back to this why, why don't we leave this up I'd like to go around again and we'll get back with you um sure. at the at the end. So so JP back to you one of the things that we've talked about in the terms of we all agree I think that there's a, an increased technology that's necessary for for the future. We've got to do things to um that the tenants want going forward. One of the things that we haven't covered specifically is this CBRS technology um that uh the um opportunity to use frequencies that the government has said are free for landlords to use what's your view of the cbrs technology piece of this uh, actually cbrs not being a technology but a frequency band but how do you view that in your world and how does that fit with the technology discussion you had sure um well i can make this brief i think cbrs looks really interesting and uh you know has lots of potential applications none of which are relevant today to anything we're doing at all Um I've had probably 10 different vendors present on this and it all looks very interesting and certainly something we should keep in mind in future proofing our networks within our buildings. I've had a single tenant ask about it and they're one of our very largest and they're fairly sophisticated and they basically were like, "Huh, this looks interesting, let's chat." But beyond that, it is not something that's moving the needle right now. 
I think there are very specific use cases that look very interesting, but they aren't in our buildings. I think down the road that may change and certainly many of the vendors that have presented to us paint very interesting pictures of what it might be used for in the future. But the other part that I'm a little confused on is <clears throat> we're potentially being asked to spend a bunch of capital to put such equipment in. And then apparently the government can just take that frequency away and give it, or some random other company that's allocating the spectrum can then take it away and give it to somebody else in the future if you don't do X, Y, Z, and that isn't the government. So I, there's a lot of questions as to the investment strategy here if you don't own the spectrum and why a company would want to make that kind of investment in something when it's not exactly clear how that spectrum allocation process will really work. And anyway, there are lots of open questions. Yeah, I think so, it's super interesting, uh, but I don't see the answers to those questions immediately available to us. And I don't see the use cases today. So again, it goes back to the thing we've talked about, Rich, which is throw crap loads of fiber everywhere. And I'm sure it'll turn out fine down the road. Yeah. So that's a great point to make here in this, because we've made CBRS a real cornerstone of this event. And I think in just what you said, no offense, there are some real misconceptions about that. Government can't take the frequencies away. But I think that bodes well for the fact that there needs to be more discussion. And as part of this panel, we're going to dispel some of those um, you know, rumors and innuendo that have been flying around about CBRS. But I think I'm really glad you raised that. And it, I think it helps everybody to understand what they need to talk about if they're going to talk to people in, in the uh, building And space. to be clear, I'm only basing it on what I've seen on 10 different vendor PowerPoints, each of which has a slightly different take on how the FCC wrote the rules and each of which says you can do this. And the next guy says, well, no, you can only do that. So rumors, innuendo, maybe, but I would suggest that the industry is all over the place and they have talking points that are all over the place. And so to the extent that they can all agree that there's a common set of rules and they all write the same things on slides, then maybe that would be... Yeah. And I think that this this event, I think John Gilbert is doing a CBRS panel that he's moderating later today. I think that will be a real eye opener for people because I think he's delved into it very deeply. But that's great, JP. I'm great, glad you raised it. Kent, thoughts on that technology, on that space at all? Yeah, well, I think if John Gilbert's talking about it, it's something we should take seriously. <laughs> I trust that man's word. So, uh, so it's certainly something to pay attention to. No, I, I certainly agree with JP. Um, but I think where the owner operator community is right now is we're in learning mode. It, it's something we, we understand that it's out there. We need to learn more about it and learn more about the, uh, the potential that it has. I think that's why events like this are so important and so great because it does provide that level of education and it allows this kind of real time feedback that we can provide to the, the CBRS entities uh, so that they know how to approach this topic, you know, because as the, the research that I've done and as I start to learn more about it, where I see some real opportunity is, again, as these tenants are coming to us looking for increased flexibility in where they locate their workspaces, what the landlord provides as a workspace versus what they build out themselves, there, there's going to be, you know, opportunities to to need to provide efficient connectivity um you know that goes beyond maybe what DAS has and the cost associated with that and so if if uh if cbrs can supplement that or replace that in a more cost effective manner then it becomes really appealing if we look at uh tenants that are looking to locate uh within one comp multiple spaces within one complex without necessarily being you know, stacked above or, or next to one another, um, you know, how the connectivity can be facilitated across those uh, office spaces, uh, again, by CBRS or, uh, you know, multiple buildings with, within a, a region or across uh, across the market, you know, how, how can CBRS support those efforts as we go to this more distributed uh, workplace, uh, potential workplace environment. And so that's, uh, that's an opportunity, I think, that CBRS could really assist us landlords with as well as as the tenants that are looking to, to, to develop that structure. Eric, um, CBRS in healthcare makes any sense to you? Absolutely makes sense. In fact, um, a lot of the um, uh, wireless and, and mobile carriers have been having uh, extensive discussions uh, with multiple healthcare systems. Um, I think the uh, what it brings is a way to slay a lot of the uh, issues uh, that have traditionally hindered um, uh, again, something new from the COVID, the, the inpatient telehealth, uh, but also, you know, campus-based robust uh, communication capabilities. So I think it's, it's coming at the right place at the right time. 
I think right now, um, and, and this panel's touched upon it, it's educating um, those investment leaders at healthcare systems, so CFOs, um, CIOs, and CTOs about the, the benefits that it brings um, and dispelling you know, some of the, the concerns about it. I think one final comment um, is the uh, financial, the, you know, the funding piece. Being able, uh, the healthcare industry right now is really struggling with the cost of COVID. So being able to bring uh, financing models um, that are able to overcome that sort of hurdle is something that's gonna be uh, very important. Chris, you're a, a telecom operator in, in addition to your um, real estate business. How do you <clears throat> well, you know, I think JP hit it and I don't mean to be negative. I think it feels a lot to me I was trying to think of a, the right analogy, but it kind of feels a lot to me about 10 years ago when everybody was going to build the best Wi-Fi system as long as I paid them lots of money. And, um, they, but there weren't a lot of rules to what it was going to be. Um, I think it's, it's going to play a role in the future, but I get a little suspect when a high school friend, a friend from high school I haven't seen in 30 years is getting me through Facebook Messenger to tell me about this one shot to do CBRS and that he's the right person. He's got the... It just, it just doesn't feel as professional as I think it will over the next couple of years. Um, it certainly goes after some issues we have. Um, and, and, and I think um, if you look at 5G, if you look at some of the, some of the things coming, this is going to play a role in, you, in how you look at it. Yep. It just feels early to me. It feels like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to make an investment um, until I understand it better. So maybe by the end of the, the next couple of days, I'll understand it better, but uh, well, I, it just I, feels I, a little snake oil to me right now. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do our best to do that. And one of the things we have a panel uh, tomorrow on um, CBRS being the gateway to 5G. So someday when, uh, as JP so eloquently put, when 5G does become something more important, one of the ways you'll be able to get that 5G is by using the CBRS frequencies. So that's kind of, a, and, and I, I agree with all of you, but if there's anyone in the wireless business listening to us right now, this bodes well for educate, educate, educate. If you're gonna go in and talk to a real estate leader, you need to go in tight and you need to educate them on what CVRS is all about. And so that really is great that it came up. And so Rahul. Rich, yeah, go ahead, Rich. Yeah. I was gonna say Rahul, um, one of the things that I find so interesting about this is the ability for um, the equipment that we've been talking about here, the, the DAS systems, the CVRS networks, other things, to be hidden in the mullions of these windows. And so um, that's a really critical thing here. If the, the promise of you is that it kind of gives me the ability to do all the things we've talked about here today and have uh, the intelligent windows um, with it. So can you talk us through that? Is that real? Sure, um, and it's a great, uh, great question. So there's a couple of things here. One is, you know, you pointed to uh, incorporating incorporating these into mullions, and there's the obvious visual benefit of elegance. I'd say the more important benefit is, as I described our solution, we're putting in infrastructure, meaning data and and power to every window, including fiber and really building in capacity. What it does is, and I think all of you would be familiar with this, uh, the cost of implementing a DAS system, a lot of it is in the labor and installation portion of it. And so if you can use the same infrastructure for building in antennas into your, into your infrastructure, that lowers the overall implementation cost and also increases because of the sheer number of windows you have in a building, also improves the coverage quite a bit. So you can actually get what I call both better and cheaper, right? It's not more, you're paying more for better. You can actually have your cake and eat it too. Both of those are uh, completely valid. Uh, there's another element of, I think uh, JP mentioned this in the beginning, 5G today is an outdoor solution because it's it, millimeter wave, especially, but even some of the other frequencies will not penetrate surfaces, whether it's glass or drywall or anything else. So you need line of sight. And this is something that some of the carriers are working on. They realize that that's going to be one of the uh, limitations to broad implementation. The advantage of putting it into the windows really is, and you see an implementation here, is to either get, get to the antenna outside and then get the signals inside, have line of sight and triangulate across the floor plate. So you get great coverage, you get great bandwidth, you get it more elegantly, and you also get it hopefully at lower cost. 
as you build your, especially for new assets, you get it at lower cost. So it is really much more, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, kind of all the attributes to think of, it checks those boxes and bandwidth, capacity, elegance, and cost. Right. Uh, so this isn't going to, this is, this is something that you're going to build in if you're building a new building and you're putting these windows in. This isn't can, necessarily replacement technology, is it? it, it it's also replacement. We're actually, it's, uh, you, it's easily retrofitable also. In fact, we have a couple of, uh, uh, we have a couple of pilots in progress with carriers. So even for existing buildings, it's possible to just go wire it and build it in. And uh, we're doing both. Uh, the other point, and I think this will be both to your earlier question on CBRS and to uh, connectivity in general. Uh, I agree, I think as far as owners and operators are concerned, there's a lot of education that's still needed and the use cases are not obvious. At the same time, there's quite a few of the larger uh, kind of big tech, and I think you have one of them speaking at the conference later, later today or tomorrow, is there are use cases already that people are working on where either latency or security and privacy are critical. Now, they also have the ability to invest the dollars and really uh, implement those. I think once those happen, probably in about 18 to 24 months, a lot, you know, it will become more obvious to the, uh, to the owner operators on why you should build this into your buildings. But the infrastructure is important. I think this is, uh, uh, we, uh, some of our trials are actually going to be with CBRS and then 4G moving to 5G quickly as the, as the radio heads get uh, certified. Gotcha. Now, one other advantage, I think, uh, Rich, I forgot to point out, I should talk about here. One of the other advantages of doing this in Windows is we are also doing schemes that are virtualized, so we make them carrier independent. So you, unlike existing DAS systems, you're not tied into a Verizon or an AT&T. Uh, you can essentially have all the, you know, cover the entire frequency range and have all the carriers. And that to landlords should be a huge benefit. Gotcha. So uh, I want to do one more round, give everybody a chance to wrap up. And uh, I, I think the most important point that's come out of this discussion is that um, in terms of any technology, and JP, you said something in Florida that really struck me. And I don't remember, I don't, I want to misquote you, but it was, don't come to me with a, a whole plan for you know, everything in the universe. What was your quote, if you remember? That was, I don't want to hear about your roadmap. <laughs> like, right. I, I, hate, I hate I hate it when vendors are like it's on the roadmap I'm like the roadmap to where right. like what, what are you talking about like when, when is that happening like no roadmaps like what's available today or potentially tomorrow right. like we're not investing I mean of course we're investing in the future with a partner but like I would like to know what you have available today right so that's a great point so if if the folks that are listening here on either side of the fence and again we have a constituency and real estate and we have a constituency in the wireless and technology space, but uh, they need to come at uh, all of the folks that are on this panel with a clear understanding of what exists and what they can, can give you. And they need to come with a clear, um, well thought out and specific program about what any new technology means like CBRS. And they need to come with a fully baked program. Um, so JP, take it from here just a minute or so before we have to end, um, wrap up for us. What would you like to have um, the, the vendors, the other folks that are listening in here today, um, discuss with you in the future? What's the, what are the needs that you think you have? I mean, look, I think that the, the market is leading us to believe that we need to spend this capital ourselves. Um, and so to the extent that we can figure out now that I need to go ask management for millions of dollars in capital to do things that we used to get for free, we need to explain not only why that's a good idea, which is pretty obvious, but also how we're going to make sure that that is a wise use of capital. Meaning in the old days, I didn't really care if at and system was gonna age out in six years. That wasn't my problem, right? Now, all of a sudden, all sorts of variables that go into this are, are things that we need to contemplate. And so things like what's the, you know, how, how quickly is all of this gonna age out? What kind of future proofing can we do when we install these systems? Those are the kinds of things we're thinking a lot about now, because if in the business of writing big checks for stuff that ages fast, those are questions that everybody is rightly asking. And so I guess I would say that, you know, when we outsourced all that to the carriers or a third party operator, those issues were not relevant. All of a sudden they are our problems now. And so, you know, right. caring about why are there or not, I've got a Cisco Meraki license and like, 
what a scam that is. I mean, the more you dig into all this licensing crap and everything else, it's just a big uh, giant cash machine sucking cash out of us. And so to the extent that we can figure out how to future proof this in a way that gives us as much leverage as possible to negotiate in the future, that's what we're trying to figure out. Got it. In a nutshell. So, so well put. Um, so uh, Ken, um, you know, wrapping up, um, what do you want people to come talk with you about? What's the, what's the, the way they should approach? Sure. So uh, I think vendors today, if, if we can put it into three buckets, um, it's what technologies and solutions can they offer me today that I need to do that, that can help support the immediate situation that we're in getting people back to the office, making sure that they feel safe, feel healthy, feel protected, uh, in their workplaces, uh, and, and encouraging them to, to return to, to the workplace, uh, on an ongoing basis. So COVID is not going to be solved in the next, you know, couple of weeks. It's going to be an ongoing uh, situation that we're dealing with. So what are the technologies that I can put in place or have in place? To help manage this. This is being some combination of people working remotely, working in the office, working from other locations, and so helping support uh, that, that kind of distributed workforce uh, solution. Last but not least is what does the future look like? You know, over the long term, how is this going to impact the long term workplace? And what technologies can support that reimagined workplace and, uh, and help that work as efficiently as, and as productively as possible? Eric, quickly with the time we have left, um, just a minute or so. Yeah, um, basically connectivity is critical. Um, the healthcare uh, facilities are not going away. Uh, they're being repurposed, uh, inspiring trust and confidence, being able to implement um, in situ telehealth capabilities, uh, building automation, efficiency systems, minimizing touch points. Um, all these things are vitally important and it needs to ride on a wireless connectivity solution whether that's CBRS or a, a hegemony of different wireless technologies, um, is something that is an opportunity uh, for those vendors to really have that meaningful conversation. The demand is there. It's, it's a great opportunity for the industry to rise to the occasion in a very clear and concise manner. Gotcha. Chris? Uh, well, just briefly, I'd say you know, to the vendors, remember, I'm not a VC. Um, and <clears throat> I'm not a visionary to, who will make your dreams come true. You really got to come to us with things that are going to solve problems right now. And I got to tell you, one of the problems that I see is, and we're, we haven't talked about it much on this, is the security angle and the hacking that's going on from people's home Wi-Fis and getting on people's computers and then getting into the VPNs. I mean, you want to solve something for me. Um, I'm not going to put a $10,000 system into an employee who rents their apartment uh, to try to make it safe. Um, make it so that um, I am feeling secure that someone's not going to steal $500,000 out of one of our accounts uh, because my employee did something stupid. And, you know, I'll leave it with this. When we used to travel, it seemed pretty simple that you tell people, do not get on a Wi-Fi at the airport. Something bad will happen. Yet once or twice a year, somebody would do something stupid like that. So it, what, what can you do to help me uh, uh, not have my employees make major mistakes with the technology and that's why I think offices will still have an important role because most of the money transfer, most of the stuff we do is going to do it in an environment that we have secured. So we, uh, we are, we've got a cybersecurity panel tomorrow uh, during the uh, event because you're right on with that, Chris. Um, this is a big deal in the work from home space. And so uh, Rahul, you get to wrap up today. Um, we have about a minute left. If the floor is yours and wrap up and then we'll end. Sure. Um, so I'll... I'd say, what do I see in the future? I agree with uh, with Eric. I think connectivity is going to be critical, and you know, implementing to uh, Chris's point, kind of secure, reliable solutions is 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 key there. I think it's a time of accelerating change. So while that introduces quite a bit of uncertainty, there's also a huge opportunity to really, I'd say, uncommoditize real estate in some cases beyond just the square feet, right? So the connectivity as well as the health aspects I talked about, I think those are both key and people will care about them more as we go forward. Uh, so we've got, we've got the view on the view from the top. That's, uh, there's a nice symmetry there. I'm glad we, uh, we got to do that. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, those listening in, please join us in the chat rooms, visit our exhibitors. Uh, thank you all so much for being here today. I think the message was great from everyone and I really, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you everyone, we're clear. Great. Thank you, Rich, for hosting you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.
Siobhan.